Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Hey, welcome into the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr., and I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Heather Thompson Day. Hello. Hi. Hey, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Um, let me read you a little bit about um, Heather's bio, if I can find my mouse here. <laughs> Heather Thompson Day is an associate professor of communication at Colorado Christian University and an interdenominational speaker and contributor for religion and news services, service, Newsweek and the Barna Group. She runs an online community called I'm That Wife and is the author of six books, including Confession of a Christian Wife, and how to feed the mediavore, and one more we'll be talking about here shortly. Uh, it's not your turn. She resides in Littleton, Colorado. She was, she's a sort of my neighbor from a far away, <laughs> and with her husband and her three children. So welcome. Thanks for being here. Is there anything you'd like our listeners? Anything else you'd like our listeners to know about you? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that I am super passionate about communication. And how, especially as Christians, we are packaging and messaging the gospel to a world that I believe desperately needs it. Yeah. See, I, boy, I'm going to have to just like control myself here because there's so many questions <laughs> I want to ask you. And we're supposed to be here to plug your book a little bit. So, well, um, share, if you would, kind of about your faith journey, uh, what your coming to faith looked like for you and what lo that looks like today. Yeah. So I grew up with, so my dad was in Broadway. Um, he was in shows like Jesus Christ Superstar and Hair. Wow. And he had a conversion experience, left New York, came to a small town in Michigan, which is where I was born. And he um, started working in ministry and he would do, it sounds really weird when I say it, but he would do plays using Bible stories. And we traveled all around the world, not just the country. We went international a ton doing that. And so I grew up in a very ministry focused family. And so I don't have a story of falling away, I would say from Christ, but I definitely remember the moment that Christ became, I think like the actual leader of my life and not just because my dad said it was a good idea or because of my mom, but I was 22 years old I can remember, I can see it. I was sitting in my little apartment. I had just called off my wedding. I was supposed to be getting married in two months. And I was trying to figure out if I, what I wanted to do with school and all this stuff. And I just had this moment where I was just sobbing and I was staring into a mirror and I was just saying, God, like, I don't want to plan my life anymore. I want you to be in control of my life and I want to make choices that allow you to better be in control of my life. And so that was the moment for me. And it, I can look back, I'm 34 now, so I can look back over the last 12 years and there's no comparison to where I thought I was headed and the plans that I would, woe to my children who have plans that are not mine. When I think back on the plans that I used to have and when I see where I am now, like, I didn't lose, and I, it's funny because when you become a Christian or when you really decide to give God control, I think there's this idea that I'm going to lose something, right? I felt that way. I just felt like, oh, I'm going to lose myself. And the only thing, my friend Justin Koo says this, and he's a Christian YouTuber, but he says, when we follow God, the only things we lose are the things we were never meant to be. And I have found that to be incredibly true. I mean, that's one of the things I love about the way of Jesus is the paradox, is the paradox of it, that in losing yourself, you find yourself. Yes. The best version of yourself. Yeah. Amen. We're, you're preaching already. I love it. <laughs> Anything you want to share uh, about your faith practices today? Yeah. A few things I think that are super relevant that I have found that work for me, take them or leave them. But I have some things I'm really militant on when it comes to my spiritual life. And one of them is getting up early and spending time with God. 
Um, I and this doesn't have to look the same for everybody. Okay, I want to say that for me, I have three children. So if I don't, I get up at 440. Wow. And spend time with God. And if I didn't do that, and this is right now it's summer, so I've, I've not been um, getting up quite that early, but definitely during a regular when I'm going to my job and all that stuff and having to get my kids out the door for school, I get up at 440 and I spend 30 minutes, 45 minutes an hour going through scripture and spending time with God and getting on my knees before him. And I have found that to be a really important decision that I made. And I, I've seen it change my relationship with him. So I just think people should spend time every day. Like if I'm going to, if I believe that God has called me to teach, which I do. Yeah. Why in the world would I not, before I step foot in a classroom, make sure I've spent time with God and invited the Holy Spirit to act and work within my life. I just think it's crazy that we think we are strong enough or wise enough or talented enough to just go off and do the things we do without seeking God first. I think that that's a grave error. So that I'm passionate about that. The other practice I would say is um, I will not ever get on social media unless I've spent time with God first. That's a good rule. That's a good one. I think it is. And I, I've just seen it be so fruitful for me. And I've been doing this for probably five years or four years, something like that. And it's just, there's so many voices. And so how do I know what I even truly think? Because it, it does affect you as I scroll. It, oh, well, I should be thinking about this and I should care about this. And this is what, you know, is the hot button right now. And what are my views? It's like, before all of that, I want to make sure that I've asked God, like, what should I be thinking about? What should I be focusing on? Who am I before you today? And and I just think we'd be a lot better online if we if we did that. Boy, that that's got to help at least at minimum. That's got to help. Well, those are two great ones. Thanks for sharing those. You know, this morning I got up and I took my kids. The house is quiet now because the kids are both in <laughs> childcare and I'm loving it. Um, but I remember my my grandfather. He's he's been deceased uh, a few six, seven years, I want to say, but it reminded me of, he was a, he was an early riser and he'd always say, get the work done before the heat of the day, heat of the day and just the importance of getting up and doing what matters first. Yeah. Well, um, let's talk about your book. So you have a book coming out. When is the release date? June 29. Oh, so it's coming up. Uh, we're recording at the beginning of June, so it's coming out soon. Uh, so when this comes out, for those not watching live, when this comes out on podcast, it'll be available. So look for that book in stores or online, I guess. Um, but the full title, give us the full title. It's called It's Not Your Turn. And the subtitle is What to Do While You Wait for Your Breakthrough. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what inspired the book. Man, what inspired it was seven years of darkness and um, feeling like, Heather, it's not your turn. So I felt like I had done a lot of things right as far as I educationally. I I was somebody that thought, oh, like if I just check the boxes, it's all going to work out for me. Yeah. I never took a summer off from I graduated from high school in 2005. Um, and so then I went to college 2005, 2006, and I never took a summer off all the way till 2017 or 2018 when I finished my PhD. And so I went straight through. That was the one thing my dad really encouraged me. He said, don't take a break. Just go straight through so that you don't forget what it's like to be a student. And I'm, I'm grateful that I did that. But then I thought, OK, I'm done. Like, I'm going to have a job. And so I kept applying to be in, and anybody who works in academia, you know, the adjunct game, it's very difficult. And I was adjuncting at like four different schools. You make no money, you know, you're teaching classes, but you don't make anything. And, but I'm standing there, I'm, I'm pretending to be like this important professor in front of my students. They don't know I'm, I'm an adjunct, right? They don't understand how that works. And at the same time, I have no, literally no money. Um, literally like my, so poor, my sister is dropping diapers off on my doorstep and then pretending she didn't do it. Right. And so I'm just sitting, I, I remember just sitting in my, my room and just crying and saying, God, I feel like I did it. I did what I thought you were calling me to do. And I am so poor and I am so embarrassed and I just need you to open a door for me. Like, where is my testimony? And at the same time, it was a few days after that, one of my best friends who I've had since third grade, who, by the way, did not even like take the same path as me, called me and, 
and she said, Heather, you're not going to believe it. And I was like, why? And she's like, I just got hired by NASA. Wow. And I was like, oh, wow. That's eh, like, eh, my, I'm choking on it. I'm like, that is, I am so happy for you. That is so great. And I was happy for her. I genuinely was, but I was just so depressed and sad for myself and bitter about myself. And I felt like the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear, Heather, it's not your turn, mm. but it's hers. Yeah. And how you treat her and how you respond matters. And so I, I, there, you know, obviously I was just living in one of those seasons where it felt like all the prayers I was praying for years God was answering for the people around me. Like I could see it on my Instagram feed. I could see it on my Facebook feed. I could see it from the friends that I'd grown up with and I wasn't seeing it in my own life and I didn't get it. And this went on literally a, a certain prayer I can think of was going on for like seven years. I eventually did get a full-time job, but it was just really hard. And I just had to just make this decision. I, I came to this point where I just realized, you know what, who I am when it's not my turn is more important than who I will be when it is. Wow. Say that again. Say that again. Yeah. Who you are when it's not your turn, when nobody cares, when nobody is like begging you to show up, when nobody's clapping for you, when you, let's put it this way. Everybody turns the podcast light on for thousands of listeners. Every, are you kidding? Everybody stands on stage for thousands or hundreds of people clapping for you. Are you serious? Like that doesn't take character. That doesn't take integrity. Anybody would do it. Yeah. And I really think that God is looking for a generation of people who will turn the podcast light on for five people because they feel called to it or get up on the stage for six people or write the letter, right? Do the thing, whatever that thing looks like for you. Without this giant praise and accolade and reward. Wow, there's so much, so much good stuff there that I don't know if we even have time just to unpack all that. But one thing I hear is just integrity. Yeah. And I, I think this was a quote uh, I remember reading that all we have in life is our integrity. Yeah. Without getting too much in detail here, I feel like the last few years, Integrity, at least from my perspective, has really kind of gotten pushed to the sidelines. And there's been kind of this ends justifying the means thing. And I've had this right. conversation with my spiritual director and she told me, Lauren, the problem with the ends justifying the means is because the problem with that is that the means become the the ends. Did I say that right? The means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So talk more about why integrity matters. Because it's all we have. And it's the only thing we can control. Mm -hmm. All I have at the end of the day, and this is this is just the way I've chosen now to live my life. Yeah. When I die, if nothing else changes, right? If, if you never get the break, big break or the relationship or, you know... The, the house or whatever it is in your life that's like, you're like, my life would be so much better if I just had this, whatever that is. All we can, we can't control those things, but we can control how we respond without them. And I've just, I, I started living this way where I was just like, you know what? It, every single person that I meet, like if I really believe this gospel thing, if I really believe this Christian thing, then every space I enter God has called me to it. Yeah. And when I teach a class, I'm not just teaching a class. I am on assignment. Heaven has called me to these students at this time for a purpose. And I'll miss that. It's going to make me cry. I'll miss that if I'm so busy worried about all about the mountaintop and what I should be getting and what I do deserve. Right. Like, let me just be faithful with my small space. And I, I just started saying that to myself, like, Heather, when a student sits in your office, I want you to talk to them as if this is the most important thing you will ever do, as if all of heaven is just silently waiting and watching you have this one conversation with the student. And when you teach a class, because this is my world, please plug in whatever it is for you people. When you teach a class, teach that class as if you've been anointed and called to be there. Yeah. See, what I love about that is just your emphasis on faithfulness, no matter the size or the scope or the reach. Um, Cause you, you talked about social media and how 
we can compare ourselves to others on social media and see like, oh, this person, like for me, I'm a pastor and I can think, look at this guy's church or her right. church and how many people they have. And, and I've been in that position as a right. new church pastor where I remember once in there was literally no one was in the, no one was in the seats. And I just start <laughs> talking as if that it was a full house of 120 people. <laughs> You know, I, and, I know that. Feeling. And now you've yeah. been there too, and that, that's what yeah. I love about what you're saying is like you got to do this and be faithful to what God has called you to, no matter what. Let me tell you this story. So I came to do a teen conference. Um, this is before COVID. It, it was probably last October or November or something like that, um, in Texas. And I show up, and there's literally like five. So there was the the women's conference and then whatever moms could get their kid, their teenagers to come, they threw in a room with me. Right. And most of the teenagers clearly were just like, I'm not into that. I'm not going to this. And so there's literally like five teenage girls and I'm supposed to get up and preach these messages to these five teenage girls. And I, you know, I was just discouraged. I was like, man, I left my kids for this. Like I, I could be home with my own family and here I am. So anyway, I was like, let's, of course, like this is my new mantra. You take a deep breath and you say, Hey, this is what God has called me to. I am anointed to this space. I'm going to do this as if it's the most important thing I'll ever do. And so I go through this weekend with them. It was actually a very powerful weekend. And at the end, the guy who was running the sound, the tech guy in the back of the room that worked for the hotel, he was not a part of the church. He was just assigned there by the hotel, said to me, you know, I, I have struggled. I don't believe in God. I have struggled with my faith for years. But I have to tell you, this weekend, you something happened to me. And I just want to thank you. Wow. And I went to my hotel room and I just cried because I'd been complaining to my husband saying, there's only like five kids. They Why would they even bring me here for five kids? And here it's like, oh, it's going to make me cry. I'm just really emotional today, by the way. But it's just like, move the goalpost, right? Like, absolutely, God will send you for one tech guy. Yeah. Are you kidding me? He has called us to seek and save that which was lost, period. Yeah. And let's be faithful. And I think that's one of the things that we miss. Maybe, I don't know if it's because of social media or whatnot, but how many, I mean, you know, it's probably better than I do. How many biblical prophets spent like yes. their whole life just knocking their heads against a wall? Like, I mean, if, if we looked at them today, we'd think what failures, what failures right. they were. Right. I think of to the, the story in Isaiah, you know, where here am I, send me. And he's all amped. And then God tells him what his mission is and it's horrible, right? And he's like, no one's going to listen to you and it's just going to go on and on. And then the next thing Isaiah says is for how long? So he's like charged up, ready to go. And then the answer God gives is as the terebinth and the oak leave a seed when they're cut down. So I have called you to be a holy seed in the nation, right? So at the end of all of that, what we learn is God saying like where other people see a stump, I see a seed, where other people see an end, I see a beginning. And I've called you to plant that seed. And let's be faithful to planting seeds. Because it's enough. Because at the end of the day, like I said, at the end of the day, when I die, that's what I... I, I and I, I don't think that's just me. Like, I think if we were all honest with ourselves, when we die, what we want is to stand before God with our integrity. Yeah. And to say, you know what? I did that. Yeah. Like I, I got up on that stirring. Like I spoke to that person that you called me to. I, I did the best I could with what you gave me. And that's it. We run the best race we can with the lane assignment we got, right? With the, the knees that we have and the feet and the shoes. And we're just like, man, I'm just going to run this race. And it's but a moment, truly. What would you say then... What are some to use? I can't remember if this Pauline. I may be making up Paul here. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. No, it's Hebrews. Looking unto Jesus, the author. Yeah, the author and finisher of our faith. Yes. Who? For, I'm thinking of something. Setting aside the things that would. Yeah, yeah. I feel so bad because this was my dad's like life verse, and I'm butchering it. <laughs> um, but you can edit this out. Google it. <laughs> Yeah, and then I'll just record it after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I remember my dad, he was a runner. He's, he still runs a little bit. Talks about 
when I was a kid, he would, uh, his big thing was the Boston Marathon. I think he ran it three times. And since oh, wow. he was a good pastor, you know, the reason he ran Boston was because it was on a Monday, whereas we lived in, in New York City and the, the New York City Marathon was on a Sunday. So we couldn't miss Sunday church. So he would go mm-hmm. to Boston, preach in a church uh, on Sunday in, a, in Boston area, and then go run the marathon. But one of his big kind of sermon was this, this scripture in Hebrews. And I remember him talking about the things, setting aside the things that weigh us down. And for me, just listening to you, it seems like discontent or comparisons are one of the things that really weigh us down um, in running our race. And what are, what are some, I don't know, I'm not sure how to ask this. What are some good practices, some ways to do that, to let go of that comparison discontent? I don't know if we ever let it go. I, I know I haven't. <laughs> so somebody who's listening, if you've figured it out, please let me know. I, I, you know what helps me, though, is to be honest. I, I have, it, through the process of writing this book, too, like I have just learned that sometimes, and I'm talking to myself, I have discovered that sometimes what has hindered my prayers was my own jealousy. Mm, yeah. Because these are God's children. And he, like, can he really truly bless me in the ways that he wants to bless me when I'm cursing somebody else? Come on. You know what I mean? Or when I'm gossiping about his kid. Like, that's his kid that I'm talking about. Yeah. That would be offensive to him. Just like, and I love, I have three children. I love all three of my children. And when one does something crazy to the other one, I don't like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. I'm like, no, you're not going to go play outside now right now because of what you just did to your sister. And I just think that we are God's kids. And I had a lot of just jealousy and bitterness because I was miserable in my own circumstances. And so I started just saying things out loud to God. And I would say, I am Lord, I am jealous of this person. Please help take this away from me. Help me to really, truly like just be happy for them. And I I spent a lot of time questioning other people's motives. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. I'd see and I'd be like, "Mm, I don't know about, you know, like, should they really be whatever it was? I felt like they were using to their advantage in ministry and, and it felt like it was thriving. And I was jealous of that. And so I'd be like, God, you're not, you're not policing them good enough. (laughs) And let me share with you this verse. Preaching to me today, Heather. Preaching to me today. Oh, let me share with you this verse. So Philippians 1, 15 through 18, it says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in change chains. But Paul says this, but what does it matter? The important thing is that every in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. What an attitude from Paul, huh? What an attitude. And I just realized, like, you know what? And I, I still have to have this conversation with myself. You guys, like, I never got to a point where I was above it. I am not above it. <laughs> but at least now I have tools where I can say, Oh, 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 this feels familiar. (laughs) This is jealousy. Let me say this out loud. And there's something really beautiful. My dad used to say this to me all the time. He would say darkness runs when you turn the light on. And so I just started turning the lights on on myself and saying it out loud. And I have I have a spiritual accountability partner that has changed my life. I've been working with her for over 10 years where when I'm struggling with something or just like need help in prayer. She's just the person I call and we talk about it. And I'm honest about the dark, nasty parts of myself. And she's been with me. And it's been so good to just hold each other accountable and be like, man, yeah, okay, you said it, you got it out. But what would God really call us to do right now? Yeah, there's something powerful about naming that stuff. Yes. I don't know if you follow uh, Steve Cuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he pastors up sort of in my neck of the woods. And I had him on, uh, I think season six before you, but that's one of the things he talks about in his, in his teaching is naming stuff really gives us a better sense of, I don't know if controls the right word, but kind of 
we're not so much controlled by it anymore if we're honest about what's happening. I totally agree. And these are principles of communication. We say the exact same stuff in communication that the more self-aware you are, the better communication choices you can make because you realize the motives behind the choices that you're making. Yeah. And I think the same is true of our faith. Yeah. Let me ask, let me, let me ask one more thing kind of on this topic. Yeah. So recently I was reading, uh, I think it was a book by Richard Stearns, uh, if you know him from uh, what, World Vision, I think. Um, oh, okay. He writes in his book, kind of, he shares a story about Mother Teresa and how, I think it was the late 90s, a senator came to visit um, Mother Teresa and was like, hey, I see all that you're doing here, but the reality is that poverty has increased. You know, things are not getting any better. And he, and he asked kind of her, like, what do, you, what do you make of that? And she said something like, you know, I've been faithful. That's what God has called me to do. And what I don't know what is your thought to, to kind of that kind of outcome because the reality is like we've talked about with Isaiah with Mother Teresa Teresa like there's gonna be some people who I it seems like that that shining moment will never come how do we commit to the journey even knowing that the outcome that we want might never happen Yeah, I talk about this a lot in the book because at some point we realize we're not running to win. Mm. We're running to learn and we're running to grow and we're running to listen. Right. So the the goal is not about is not to beat the people. And, and this is actually here's a great track metaphor. I ran track for six years. I had a college scholarship for track. Oh, cool. Yeah. Great, great metaphors in running for life. Um, but you're not in track, they say never look at the person in the lane next to you. Mm -hmm. It's like a rule because even if like every 10th of a second matters in in sprinting anyway. So you would never even turn your head to see where they're at. You have to just keep your eyes on your own lane, on your own finish line and push yourself through to the end. And I think the same is true of life. That's not your race. You can't come. What? Their race is not your race. They didn't have the same parents you did. They don't have the same marriage or no marriage. That you, yeah. Yeah. So why are you judging something that is, we don't run to be better than the person next to us. We run to be better than ourselves. And that is how you have to run this race. It's the only fulfilling way that I found I could be corrected. It's the only fulfilling way that I have found to live my life to say, how do I be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday? Yeah. Boy, there's so much, so much good stuff there. I I ran cross country and I I was not as good a runner okay. as you, um, <laughs> and I until I ran probably 20 years. I've had to stop because of a back injury. But one of the things that I remember, the thing that I really appreciate about running, even when I was doing um, road races, is you realize like I'm not I'm not competing with the person next to me like their situation is totally different than me like for me it's like this some 20 something who's got no kids and no no real right. job i'm competing with myself to do the best that i can do today and sometimes sometimes i i had to tell myself like the best i could do today wasn't the time that i wanted to do but i had to i had to tell myself like that was the best i could do with what i had that day yeah and this sometimes you get to where you're going faster by slowing down Hmm. And in a distance race, you know that, right? Like I could push myself to where I can't even move. And now I have to sit down or pass out. I've actually like passed out over a finish line and vomited over it. And that's taken me out for some time. Right. As opposed to just me saying, Oh, I don't have it. Yeah. I got to slow down for this stretch. And when I can put it in gear again, I will. But right now I got to slow down because I've got to be able to finish the race. So sometimes we get to where we're going faster by slowing down. And so you have to know what season you're in. And that's why checking in with the Holy Spirit every single day is so important. You might be in a season where it looks to other people or to yourself like you aren't doing anything Mm -hmm. or you're not where you want to be or you've slowed down. And maybe that's okay because what God has called you to is going to take something called stamina. Mm. And so what he's saying is rest now, child. I want you to gain some stamina because where we're headed, it's going to take it all out of you. I'm thinking Elijah when you were saying that, you know, 
Yeah. Remember under the bush? What is it? Under the bush or the trees? Yeah. The angel comes to Elijah. Get up and eat. He goes back to yep. bed because you're gonna need rest. For, you're gonna need for, for the journey. Yeah. So rest, and this is you know in in America, rest is like punishment. <laughs> and yet we worship a God who has commanded, which is a whole other conversation. He has commanded our rest. Yeah. Wow, this is good stuff. Let me um, let me ask you this question. And it, uh, what do you say to someone who I don't? And maybe I miss. Maybe this is not the right question to ask, but it feels like a question that uh, that I have sometimes. I wonder myself, like, what if you've missed your shot? Mm, I I don't. I just don't know that I believe that. I think I used to believe that. I used to think, oh, I used to view God as like this really punitive person who, if I did the wrong thing, he was skipping over me. But it's funny because it's like you read scripture and we see this God of grace like over and as much as people don't like the Old Testament, you can't deny that in the Old Testament, you see this God of grace that just keeps extending himself to a people that do not deserve it. Yeah, you're not wrong. Right. So I just feel like he makes a crooked path straight. And yeah, like maybe we we wander around the desert for another 40 years when we should have been getting somewhere sooner. That could be. Yeah. But I just I just think what God has for you is for you. Hmm. And so the goal is to get there's this evangelist. His name is Lee Venden. And he used to say this. He'd say a relationship with God is like getting on an elevator. And he'd say, what happens if you fall down inside of an elevator? nothing. Hmm. You just, you get back up. Hmm. And the idea in our relationship with Christ is to just never say, you know what, forget this. I'm done with this and get yourself off the elevator. The goal, if you fall down is eventually, yay. When you, when you can, you pick yourself back up and you stand back up. Nothing changes in the relationship. He, he is not done with you. God is never done with you. You make a decision to say, I'm done with this. Right. A righteous man falls down seven times, but gets up eight. A wicked man falls once into calamity. Right. The righteous man falls more in the case of the righteous versus the wicked. Who falls more? Yeah. The goal of our Christianity is to get back up. Dust yourself off. Get back up. He hasn't gone anywhere. And he's just saying, are you ready, bro? (laughs) You ready now? Let's take a few more steps. And if you fall down again, that's okay. Get back up. Just never leave the relationship. And then it becomes about this beautiful journey. Hmm. That there's no time clock over, right? And there's not supposed to be like winners and losers. There's just the journey. And we and here's the beauty of it. We get to go on it with God. Mm-hmm. If I told you that you could talk right now, I'm going to get you on the phone with like, you know, Billy Graham or with T.D. Jakes or Stephen Furtick. He's going to he's calling you right now and and he's going to mentor you. You, We would all be like, oh, my goodness, this is happening. Right. We get to do that with God. Hmm. And I think it's really sad that that Satan has allowed us to miss the greatest point, that his presence is the blessing and we never lose his presence. Yeah. We don't lose that. Moses is in a desert and God says, remove your shoes. The place you are standing is holy ground. The desert that he has fleed to after thinking, what'd you say? That he missed his shot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's good stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. God is so good. I need to say this to myself because I'm in a season at this moment where I just got some bad news this week and I've been like just so confused by it and trying to understand, okay, what am I supposed to learn in this moment? And so I just need to remind myself, God is so good and he's not gone anywhere and your life is never in someone else's hands. I don't care who didn't give you that job. Your life isn't in their hands. Yeah. Your life is in the hands of God and his favor cannot be removed from you. So we just keep walking forward, broken and bruised and dirty. Hey, we're going to keep walking forward. Wow. This, this last five minutes has been incredible. Uh, and 
if if no one else got anything from this, uh, Heather, know that I did. I got <laughs> something from that. Praise him. Yeah. Let me ask something. Uh, Praise God. Kind of off topic, but I think it's important, and I think it's relevant to this conversation. You're a pastor's wife. Um, yeah. You've experienced, at least through your relationship with your husband, seeing so many of the struggles that ministry leaders have gone through in the last year plus um many people feeling like they're in the desert wondering if they've blown it made because there's just so many decisions that always seem like the wrong decision Mm -hmm. can you share a little bit about kind of just what you've seen maybe if not i don't want to break confidentiality maybe with your husband but from an outside perspective maybe what you've seen and what what kind of advice you might have for pastors they, they try to get back on track or whatever and communicate these important truths uh, to their congregations as we, as we get back to quote unquote normal. Yeah. I feel for pastors. It's very, we know just statistically like 80% of pastors say that their job has negatively affected their family. And it's true. (laughs) It's like 70% of pastors say that they don't have any close friends, right? Like this is a very lonely existence. Um, And of course, like we should always look, I think all pastors should look to Moses, who is leading people who constantly don't want him to be leading them (laughs) until he's dead, right? Then they love him. (laughs) But up until then, they're constantly like trying to get somebody else. His own sister turns on him. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like a never ending. We'll take a golden calf instead of Moses. Yeah, it's just like this never ending thing for for Moses and Moses. And here's what my mentor says to my husband and I is leaders lead. Mm. And if all it takes for the devil to make you quit is for someone to hurt your feelings. You'll always quit. Mm. And at some point, if you are a leader, you have to just believe that leaders are called to lead. Yeah. And you keep moving forward. And so, and here's what my husband and I have come to. um, And this is going to be some married privilege, but you could probably insert other people that you love if you're not married. But my husband, we just went on a walk yesterday morning because I told you we got some bad news this week. And so we went on a walk yesterday morning, a prayer walk. And I'm I'm crying <clears throat> and I'm just saying, I don't get it. I don't understand because everything seemed like this is the direction we're supposed to head. And then just, it didn't work. And it I did not see it coming. And my husband said, what if, what if the test isn't this event? What if the test is always about our relationship hmm. and whether or not we draw near to each other in this time, despite whatever happens? Hmm. What if we just choose to hold each other up and to love each other, no no matter what the big bad world throws at us? And that's it. And it was just really beautiful for me because I I realized, I'm telling you, I I think we can get through almost anything when we get through it together. Hmm. Yeah. Well, this has been an incredible 35 minutes. Uh, Let's take a quick break. And we'll come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with Dr. Heather Thompson Day. And again, Heather, thanks so much for your time. You know, to go back to your story about Texas or whatever, like if if I'm the only one who ever hears this, it has been a blessing to me. So know that today. Um We'll change gears here a little bit. You, could, I always tell folks you can take these closing questions as seriously or not as you'd like to. Um, okay. But if you're Pope for a day... What does that day look like? What do you want to do? Oh, man. Like in regards to the church? You know, it's open for interpretation here. <laughs> um, I think if I was in a leading position of the church for a day, I would call all of us to repentance. Um, I think that's what we are all lacking is the time. I actually walk people through this in my book going alone into your own quiet place and safe space and just saying, God, what is hindering, what is preventing me right now from having a heart fully devoted from me, from you? Please whisper that into my ear. And when I said that, I heard something, not audibly. I've never heard that. I want to be very clear. I have never heard the voice of God audibly, but I've definitely heard that whisper, that nudge of the Holy Spirit. And for me, I'll just be honest, actually, um, for me, 
what I felt like God said was, you don't have to keep asking me to bless your ministry or bless your career or to exalt you. And actually those prayers, Heather, really sound a lot like Lucifer. Oh, wow. You don't have to ask me to exalt you. Just ask me to be with you. Ask me to be close to you. Ask me to live in you. These are the prayers that you need to be coming to me for over and over and over. Not for this big thing. And I, and it was just like, I cried because I didn't see myself in that way. And especially, you know, when we are working for the gospel, you think that all these things are good. And so you're like, but I want a ministry because I want to, I want to change people for the kingdom. Right. And we put these bows on it and I just had God kind of call me out on that. So if I was, and I realized I needed to repent. And so if I was Pope for a day, I would say, Hey, let's all, we're going to do, we're going to take a day and we're going to go into our rooms, into our safe spaces and our quiet spaces. And I just want you to say to the Holy spirit, what am I, what am I not seeing clearly? Please convict me of my own sin right now and let me lay it up before you. And let me just say, I'm sorry. Wow. And then I'm going to get back up because I'm still in this elevator and we're going to keep moving forward. I love how you kept that metaphor in. Love it. Yeah. (laughs) A theologian or historical Christian figure you would want to meet or bring back to life. Mm, Definitely Martin Luther King Jr. for me. Um, Very moved by his ministry. I actually think that there's, there was inspiration. I don't know if you, if you guys haven't watched his last speech that he gives right before he's killed. He literally, it's like hours before he's murdered. And he literally says, actually, this fits with the book, right? It fits with, it's not your turn. He literally says, I may not get there. I may not get there with you, but I've seen the Lord has allowed me to see the mountaintop. And it's filled with his glory. Um, I just think, man, I mean, it was it was a prophetic moment in his life. So there was no doubt in my in my mind that he was being led by the Holy Spirit. Another um, Joseph Wolf, W-O-L-F-F. He's this Jewish missionary that becomes a Christian. And I've just been so I used to read a lot Fox's Book of Martyrs and I. Um, I think that's where I first discovered Joseph Wolf, but he would go into like these parts of the country of um, the world that nobody else was going with the Christian message. And he'd been beaten several times, robbed several times, left naked and for dead several times. And he would still, he would go like just on this, as this one man shop and people would say to him, like, what are you doing? Why are you going to these places that are, they're going to kill you? Why are you going alone? And he would say, oh, I bring my Bible with me. Hmm. And I just believe every time I open it, that legions of angels have surrounded me. Wow. And so he was just able to be this incredible evangelist and missionary all on his own, just because he was faithful, right? Despite what happened. So those would be, and of course, oh, C.S. Lewis. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. C.S. Lewis too. Um, you'll have a, you'll have a nice greeting, nice little coffee table, round table conversation with those three. Yeah. Right. Um, what do you think history will remember from our current time and place? Oh. Mm. Um. I don't know. It's hard to say because I think I'm I'm personally so in the thick of it that I'm sure I'm not seeing things clearly. Sure, sure. Right. So I don't know. But I know that I do like my hope <laughs> is that in this time and place, God raises a generation that has integrity and that is faithful. And I really think that's what we're we're missing. I, we just don't have any leaders anymore like we used to, like the people I've named, right? But we, we don't have, and I'm not saying that they don't exist. I'm just saying that there, there hasn't been like this unifying figure right, to help the church, I think, move forward. And, and that's been hard. And so I just think, hey, if the Holy Spirit's calling you, like, be faithful, have integrity, serve where you are. Mm-hmm. And I hope that that's what they'll remember, at least of me, that she served where she was. Yeah. Uh, well, this kind of this kind of fits in. So you could use the same answer if you want. Your hopes for the future of Christianity. Is it just more leaders with integrity kind of thing? You know, 
my big hope, not just, yeah, leaders with integrity, but also like, I just would hope that we can be unified again. And I don't think unity looks like conformity. Right. Not uniformity. Right. And we see, is it in Revelation 7? My friend David Ashrick always says this and he's going to say it better than I do. Times of every Revelation nation 9? tongue. Is that where you're going? Where, yeah. Is that what you, what you just say? Tribes of every nation tongue. Yes. Right. So when John sees heaven, he sees, first of all, a multitude that could not be numbered. Hey. Right. This isn't, we, I think we look at God, like I said, I think, and I know this 72%, here's the actual data for you. I'm filled with useless information. 72% of Christians see God as angry, as judgment, as wrath, right? He's out to get me. But John sees a multitude that could not be numbered. I think we look at heaven, or at least I knew as a kid or with my friends, I don't know who taught me this, but at some point the church made me feel like I'm going to get in by the skin of my teeth. Yeah. And I have to be perfect and I have to do everything right. And maybe if I am, if I just pray hard enough and tr- and work my way there, I'll just barely cross into there. And, and John says, no, I see a multitude that couldn't be numbered. And there's 12 gates, meaning you can come in this way or this way or this way or this way. Right. And they all have different languages. They're all from different tribes. Tribalism is a big word right now. Yep. So these are vastly, totally different people. These are Republicans and Democrats in all different denominations, different language, different races. And yet they all cry, this is our God. So the unifier is that they love Jesus Christ. And I, that would be my hope for the church is that we can come to a place where I don't demand that you agree with me on complementarianism or egalitarianism or an annihilationism. It's like, dude, none of these things really matter because in heaven, we'll probably talk about it. <laughs> you know, it's like we all, and here's what bothers me is we all actually agree that none of these things are keeping you out of heaven, but yet we'll spend all of our time on earth distracting from the actual gospel and just arguing each other to death about who's right and who's wrong and how this is tainting your picture. And it's just so, I just, I just would love to have us come to a place where we are so in love with Jesus that I can sit at a table with somebody who totally disagrees with me. Mm-hmm. And say, but tell me about how all these things have you see Jesus differently. Hey, I don't have to accept it. I can still disagree with you. But man, I see that you love Jesus and that's awesome. And he's probably using you to reach people that I could never reach. As Paul says, we proclaim and rejoice that the gospel is being preached. I love it. Yeah. I, well, I could spend, we could spend another 20 minutes talking about that. Uh, this has been such a great conversation, Heather. I really appreciate you sharing. And like I said, if no one else hears that, know that it's been a blessing to me. Um, but hopefully there are some listeners. Uh, and for those <laughs> listeners who don't know, tell, tell where they can find out more about you and uh, get a copy of your book. Yeah. um, My book is just, it's not your turn. You can type that into Google and it will bring you to Amazon or to IVP, who's my publisher, and you can order it from there. Um, You can find me on Twitter at Heather T as in Thompson, Heather T Day, D-A-Y, or go to my website, heatherthompsonday.com. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Really appreciate it. And uh, hey, have a, it's going to be, it's going to be warm over these next few days. So get out. Praise him. Enjoy the weather. Yes. Thank you so much, Lauren. This has been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is produced by Torn Curtain Arts in partnership with Resonate Media. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit futurechristian.com. If you've enjoyed the show and you think it would be valuable for others to hear, subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. That really helps more people find us. Thanks again and go in peace.